So, welcome back guys to another video of the Mitsubishi Evo project. Now you can see in the last video that we've got to take this engine out. There's no way of changing the bearings without uh, taking this engine completely out. So this video is going to be stripping this engine bay down, getting this engine out. I'm going to start off with taking all the auxiliary bits around the engine bay out. So in case you didn't see the last episode, this is the problem we've got. So you can see here, we've got a nice fresh bearing here, nothing wrong with it, just the slightest bit of wear. And you can see on number four cylinder, we've got a spun bearing. Now, if you wanna know how to diagnose this issue, go back and watch the last video and you'll see exactly what I've done to find out what the problem was. Um, this is, as I say, number four bearing. Um, number one bearing was absolutely fine. Um, so we're gonna pull the engine out now. We're gonna start stripping it down. So let's start off with stripping down this engine bay. So starting off, we're going to take all the ancillaries off. So what I mean by that is like boost hosing, water hosing. We're going to take this radiator out just to make things easier. We're going to take all this manifold turbo setup off. So I'm just starting off by draining off the water. This radiator is massive, so it takes a ton of water. So I've just released the pressure cap off the top. So the first things I like to do when I'm stripping down a car, especially for a big job like this, is just to remove everything that's in the way. Now you can see I've removed the radiator, the intercooler, all the boost hosing, I've even removed the cross member, um, all the headlights, the indicators, the whole lot. And that just allows me to get everywhere inside the engine bay. Now you'll thank yourself later for this, because if there was an intercooler or a radiator in the way here, you wouldn't be able to get to a lot of the bolts, or you would be able to get to them, but they're a lot more difficult to get to. So um, it's counterproductive to not do so. And you can see how much more space there is now between the turbo. The radiator would have sat right close up here. It would just made it more awkward. Work smarter, not harder. So just remove things that are around it. You'll get things done a lot quicker. So next things out of the turbo. Now you can see this, these top studs here, there's no clearance there for the nuts. So they're seriously fiddly. Uh, someone had changed them for 12 millimeter nuts just to get the clearance and it actually works really nicely so i've undone all them you don't need to see me undoing them it's boring um, these end studs are 14 so they got to an m10 on the end everything's undone just got to unplug this uh wide band sensor quickly and she should pop straight out so that's the turbo removed you can see these evo turbos how big they are the setup is going around the engine bay at the minute doing things that you don't need to see so like taking off fuel lines all the looms disconnected now you can see i've took off the strut brace as well because it allows me to get to the back of the inlet a lot easier so i'm glad that they've upgraded these fuel lines to like the proper am fittings as well because it means that we can run um, race fuel in the future nice braided lines all the way down all the way through to the tank probably have to upgrade to uh, bigger injectors because they take about double the amount of fuel and twin fuel pumps but it's an option in the future As you see, I just took the inlet off. I love it when you take the inlet off. It always hides things behind it. So um, you've got this connector here. I think it's a knock sensor. I haven't looked properly. You can see that's either been dragging along the ground or something's going on there. Um, that obviously ain't working. And we've got uh, like bits of wiring. Instead of doing it properly, I've just like wrapped it up with bits of black tape. Things are cable tied to the subframe. When people hide stuff away like this, um, drives me mad so just gonna get all this wiring off now gonna take the alternator off which makes it a little bit more easier then I'm gonna get around to popping them drive shafts out first off it's obviously got to take the ball joints so really all that's left to do now is we've got to take the transfer case off the back you see that's that down there and then take it out the prop shaft so I've already started loosening off these bolts you can see you've got three at the top and three at the bottom I've already took out the driver's side shaft so that's out already. So I'm gonna take out the passenger shaft as well. Then I've got to take out the intermediate shaft under the oil cooler. And then pretty much this is only held on now by the uh, engine and the gearbox, man. I've took the uh, subframe cross member off as well. So that's off as well now. So I'm gonna drop this down underneath because I'm just gonna let gravity do the work. It's a lot easier. Use the engine crane just to lower it down and put it onto a, a wheelie platform. And then I can just lift the car up and pull the uh, engine and gearbox out. So I've just dropped the engine, gearbox, transfer case all down together. You can see I didn't even bother separating it all. Just took it off the prop shaft, dropped the engine mounts down, and then all I've done now is I've just raised the car right up in the air, just enough to get the engine out. You can see, easy enough. Just get it up with the engine crane. It's got no weight on the front now anyway, because all the engine and everything's out, all the weight's out of it. So you can see it clears the cross member and you see here i've loaded it down onto a trolley just so i can wheel it about move it out of the way so i'm going to get that out of the way from under there now and i can load the car back down onto axle stands 
Right, so as you can see, the engine's finally out. I couldn't get a lot of filming done last night. It was dark and I just wanted to get on with it and it would have slowed me down. I needed to get it out. Um, you can see the same rather large missing now inside this engine bay. So what I've done is I dropped the whole lot down together, the transfer box, the gearbox, um, the engine all together, dropped it out the bottom and then just lifted the car over the top. It's the easiest way to do it with these cars because you've got these chassis legs and the um, the mounts. It's just a ton easier to drop it out the bottom than it is to lift it out the top. So you can see left all the engine mounts and everything in. Uh, you can see how nasty this engine bay is. So we're gonna give this a jet wash and a scrub down eventually. And then uh, have a look at where we can tidy up some of this wiring because it's literally just been cable tied all over the place. Um, not really sure what's going on. Have a look at this fuel uh, pressure regulator situation because you can see this one's rubber but then it does look like an aftermarket push on fitting so I'm hoping that these have got the uh, lining in them that we can use race fuel in them because that's what we're going to do in the future you can't have a high power engine like this and a standalone ECU without using race fuel it's ridiculous and you can see the mess of wiring we've got over here and that's one of the first things I point out but you can see how messy that is I mean I want to get that off the chassis leg if I can have a look at that see what's going on there so that's it really we're going to shut the bonnet on this nav for a while and then we're going to clean it up eventually but now i've just got the engine on the engine stand um, you can see i've took the flywheel off already and the xd trim plate clutch so i can bolt on the engine stand left the oil cooler on for now just so that the oil weren't draining out all over the place and now we could get to start stripping this down so i can pull this inside the garage now and actually uh strip this lot down so as you know, this run low on oil, so oil pressure got low. So it's gonna check all the bearings on the cranks, the mains, the big ends. So this is the flywheel off the car. Obviously it's a light and exedy flywheel. You can see it's took some serious heat. So we're gonna reface that flywheel as well. Just give it a quick skim, just to get it nice and flat again. And you can see that this inner clutch plate of the twin plate has got no meat left on the inner side. So that's gonna to have to be replaced. You can see we caught it just in time before it started scoring up the plate which is a good sign. So some things come like silver lining and all that. You can see this inner one is toast. So you can see that's gonna have to be replaced. Luckily, XED do separate plates that we can replace these two with. So we'll replace both of them while it's at. So we'd have to pull the gearbox off for this very, very soon anyway. I'm surprised this wasn't slipping already. There's absolutely no meat left. So now the engine's out of the car, gonna get to stripping this down. So gonna start off on the auxiliary side. Um, you can see the belt's already taken off. Uh, I've already undone the auto tensioner, going to remove that. The crank pulley is already off and I've started to loosen off some of these bolts. Before I move anything else, I wanted to show you how this cam belt system works. It's very similar to how the Subaru system works. It's got an auto tensioner. And this is a piston type auto tensioner. So this is the tensioner here. And then this piston pushes on that arm and auto tensions this cam belt system. And most of the Japanese cars just held on by two 12 mil bolts. And as long as it ain't leaking from either side, it's good to go again. So you stick a pin in there um, once you've got this off and you can push that piston back in and stick a pin in there and it's almost like a grenade you pull it out and it auto tensions up the cam belt so once I've got this cam belt off I can start taking out the camshafts and we can undo the uh, H11 head studs So it's time to get removing these camshafts you can see on the exhaust side we've got the cam angle sensor which is here so this attaches to here. So you've got to take this off first. Um, you can see that's proper gunked up with a load of sealant. And on the inlet side, there's nothing. So that just comes out plainly. When you undo these camshafts, undo them from the outside inwards. Otherwise you can snap them. I mean, I've never snapped a camshaft in my life, but you can, it is possible to do, especially the hollow ones. So start from the outside and work your way in. So when it comes to cam caps, you've always got to have them in order. Now on these cars, they're nicely labelled up. You can see E1, E2, E3, E4 and E5. Now obviously E means exhaust and then on the inlet side you have I1, I2, I3, I4, I5. 
and then that obviously means inlet sides and the cam caps they always start number one is on the cam pulley end always make sure you get these right way round if you don't you're gonna have a lot of problems with wear Cam shafts are out, as you can see, just got a couple more bits like thermostat housing and some covers on the cam built side to remove. Once they're removed, then I can just crack off all these head studs down in there, and then we can get this head off and see what's going on inside. So the head is off and it looks good inside here. You can see it's very clean still from the last rebuild. It hasn't done many miles at all. So you've got the heavy duty pistons in there and um, you can see there's hardly any carbon build up on them. They're clean up nicely. And the good thing about it is, well, it has got all the parts that it said it's got. So you can see clearly there, this is the Cosworth head gasket that it said it had. Um, I think it's a 1.3 millimeter one. The funny thing is it's in such good condition that if I needed to replace a head on track or I had a problem, I would be happy to reuse that gasket again. Uh, Multi-layer steel gaskets, uh, the Cosworth ones are so good. And obviously you can clearly see we've got the head studs in there as well. So we've got loads of good parts to go on the next build. Um, you can see in here, well, I have to get one of the pistons out so I can show you. Obviously they're not connected to the crank. So I'm just gonna get the residue oil that's out of here so that it doesn't spew all over my garage floor and then I'll pop a piston and a rod out and I'll be able to show you them up close. And there we have one of the uh, rods and pistons that I've just popped out the bottom of the block. 2618 alloy piston, so take serious, serious heat. These pistons will do a thousand horsepower. And so are these rods. The limiting factor to this engine for it to do serious numbers is obviously the steel crank, needs a steel crank, um, and maybe a set of liners. But you can see these are the manly I-beam rods that they said they were. So that's going to save a lot of money because these are in really good condition still and the pistons are as well. Absolutely perfect. That must be the part number from there so I'll look them up. There's no play in any little ends. The piston rings look perfect. There's no debt marks at all on the top of the piston. They'll clean up nicely. So um, got a good, uh, good base to start with again. So really I'm going to pull that crank out now and just check what's going on inside there. So as we're getting rid of this crank anyway, we're going to scrap it. I've done a hardness test on the big end bearing on number one because I wanted to know why number four chewed up so badly. And so what I suspected was right. This bearing um, or the journal, I don't know about the main jet because I ain't got the crank out, has been reground. Um, and now I'd say that's a big, big no-no on a rebuild on a big power engine. Um, when these cranks are made, they're hardened. When you grind them, you take that hardening off. Unless you re-harden them, frozen solid, nitrided, whatever, they're always going to have a soft journal. So if you're going to build a high power engine, never use a reground crank. So I just got one of the bearings that come out of the rods and just to uh, verify what I said, you can see on there 0 0.025 millimeter oversized. So these are oversized bearings on this. Um, there's no way on a high power engine like this, big power engine, that I'll be using oversized bearings. I always use a virgin crank that's been hardened um, from the factory or hardened uh, by nitride in it. There's no way I'll be using an oversized bearing, so that crank is going in the bin and we're going to use stock size bearings. So now the engine's all drained down of the oil and fluids, so I'm just going to get this number two and number three rod and piston out, and then we can start getting this crank out so we can take off the bridge, main caps, crank pulley, etc. So let's get on with that. So on the crank pulley side of a 4G63 engine, quite a lot happens. So you've got the crank pulley that I've just removed off here and that's just held on by the main bolt. That just slides off. Then obviously you've got your woodruff key, but behind it, you have a timing disc. Now this timing disc spins and then it picks up on this crank sensor. The crank sensor is normally bolted to there. And then behind that, 
is another pulley and this is for the balancer shaft so similar to the z-lets but the z-lets are inside the sump these are this pulley is on the external when it's got a normally got like a mini cam belt that goes around here so the tensioner sits on there and the balancer shaft goes on here now you can see that these have been deleted so um, you can see that's where the bolt with the tensioner would be and this has been bunged here to stop the oil coming out so as I explained in the last video, these caps on these rods are notoriously difficult to split apart because once they've been torqued up, they're obviously wedged into the dowel pins and they don't want to move. Never get a screwdriver and try wedging them apart. The quickest way to do it is the socket that you're using to undo them, in this case is a 12.11 mil. You crack them off, but you only undo them about halfway, you can see there. Get your socket and then just tap evenly on each side of the socket. You can hear it pushes the other part of the rod apart and there you go so now the top of the rod cap you can just undo the bolts off the top get the last bolt out and you can see that the rod cap then just pops off with ease no prying it apart no damaging it And then the last thing to take out is the crankshaft. So that's one fully stripped down engine. So we can assess that now. So that's one fully stripped down 4G63 Evo 5 engine. So on the next episode, we're gonna be going through everything, cleaning it all up and uh, having a look, assessing the damage. Um, as I say, cleaning the parts up and getting it ready for the next rebuild. Um, just at first glance already, you can see how nasty these bearings are on the mains. So this crank is going in the bin. Or it's just going to be used as an ornament and that way we can start ordering parts and uh, then we can show you how to rebuild one of these properly so on first proper inspection now of number four journal bearing and you know that this is the bearing now that spun inside the rod and um, you can clearly see we have a very nasty crack going left to right across the radius of the journal you can see it goes all the way down the inner radius as well and this wasn't far off snapping in half this crank so um, a couple more launches this crank would have been in half. You can see that this is the flywheel end of the crank that takes all the strain, and then all the strain goes through this journal bearing. So in a way, I'm very, very happy that we caught this early and we didn't let this go because it would have literally took out the whole engine. It would have took these rods in half. These rods would have come out the side of the block. There would have been metal everywhere and that would have been game over to this block. But we got it early and I'm very happy about that. The crank is out of the 2.4 um, block and it allows us to have a 100 millimeter stroke. Now these are prone for cracking here because they produce so much torque but one of the reasons that this probably has failed is due to grinding and um, this had 0.25 millimeter grinded off so in the next video we're going to discuss what the options are and what we're going to do about the next build <laughs>